All right. So one of the uh, issues that you had to deal with in an underwater setting, the first room was underwater completely. So first of all, you had to have a way to breathe. Second of all, some of you weren't able to talk unless you moved to one corner of the room, and that took time. In the puzzle rooms, you didn't have to worry about encumbrance necessarily, but uh, it was a exercise in alternate ways to communicate. <clears throat> By that, I mean hand gestures and hopefully the nice ones. But uh, the idea of this room, you were presented with the fact that, that you had to reset or essentially reconstruct a temple. And you were given a dead squid as your tool to do so. Oh, dead jellyfish. Okay. Look like calamari to me. Okay. So a dead jellyfish, which was actually some surgical tubing and ropes. And the idea was that the group would have to work together to try to manipulate uh, the spheres that were laying on the altar. Uh, you had a little bit of a red herring in that the spheres had color, but the color really had nothing to do with the puzzle necessarily. No, not at all. What you needed to do was actually get the spheres over to you. You couldn't break the plane of the, of the dais as it was, but you could get the, the spheres over to you and actually shake them or move them. And you could tell one had rocks in it, one had sand, one was very light, and one was supposed to sound like it had water and it was a little sloshy. And you had to actually go from what was in them to where they needed to go. And so then you place them on the appropriate... Uh, appropriate plaques or pillars. So obviously, Ezra, goddess of the sea, would be the one with water in it. Sky would be air, yes. Desert would be sand and earth, right? Yeah. But hopefully, this was fun. And also, the the room had a had a pearl uh, or a, a pearl looking like thing. And uh, if if you touched it, you could then talk underwater. And in fact, the whole group, if they would touch it at the same time, could talk together. And then you were given this pearl to carry with you throughout, or at least further on into the dungeon. We'll say. So, I, ideally, if the players walked into this room and they would look, they would see on, on one side, they would see the uh, back cast video. You would see the siren swimming back and forth, or at least a female swimming back and forth. And you'd hear the song, this, this singing in the background. Now, at that point, if you didn't tell the DM that you were doing something to avoid being mesmerized, either sticking your fingers in your ear or having your bard sing, you, were me you had to roll to save to see if you were mesmer mesmerized by the uh, siren. If you were, you were made to stand aside. Your party could wake you. They would have to smack you around a little bit. That would cause a little bit of damage. Maybe some were a little more heavy-handed than others. I don't know. At some point, uh, once this process of mesmerization occurred, they would suddenly change and turn into something a little more nefarious. You had the, the two sirens. One was a spellcaster. The other one was a fighter. Uh, the spellcaster cast magic missile. And um, in nightmare settings, she had unlimited magic missile. So there wasn't, if you were waiting for it to run out, sorry, guys. Land dwellers, it's not common for me to see your kind so deep beneath the depths. Perhaps you are lost on your way to the castle alabaster. If that be the case. If you walked into this, the combat side of the dungeon, you'd see a, it looked like a half circle, sort of, well, shower curtain-y type thing. It looked like seaweed, sorry, and a chest. And uh, as soon as you entered, the curtain would open and a mermaid would, would uh, attract your attention and, and plead with you to help her open the chest. So... If you chose to try to help her, and if you started to look closely at the chest, you would be attacked um, by an eel, by a dire eel specifically, and you would have to do combat with that. Now, what you were, uh, what you didn't know was the mermaid wasn't necessarily evil, so casting detect evil on the mermaid wasn't going to tell you very much. She was out for herself, though, so she wasn't necessarily there to help the party, like she was claiming to be. And, of course, she wondered, did you, uh, if you killed the eel, did you actually get the chest open? And if you did, supposedly she would promise you the information for a shortcut to, uh, to a way around some of the other dangers that lie ahead. She lied, of course. Okay, uh, and the, on the puzzle side, you, you run into the mermaid again, and she's um, giving you a little help, supposedly. Uh, there is a, a wrecked ship that has a, a, a part of the side, and the old ships used to have sigils on them for, like, luck and things like that. So you had to have, you had a little pegboard. You had to, uh, you had to start on the, the golden peg. Yeah, actually, that, yeah, that one actually connects in a little different spot, but that is pretty much it. Um, you, you had to start on the, the golden peg, and it gives you the clue that you must go counterclockwise, and it's 
it says something about two feet. Each length of rope or the, uh, the distance between the pegs is actually two feet. So once you measure that out and you start going around and you wrap the, uh, the rope counterclockwise and you do have to keep it very tight for it actually to match up, you'll, you'll go around and you will make that fish, which is basically a good luck sign, a fisherman. Yeah. So, and then she, uh, if you solve it, she pushes you on through with nothing bad happening. Um, this was the squid. This is the dire squid. There was a sign over on the wall and that was really to attract your attention away from the curtain. And as you were reading it, there was a, a blue hand behind the scenes that would open the curtain and trigger the pneumatic effect of, of this squid jumping out and attacking you. The one thing that the party could have done Instead of fighting, of course, it was the combat side, so presumably you wanted to fight, but there was a way to avoid the fight, and that was the supposed pearl that you were carrying was actually her egg. And if you had a druid who attempted to speak to her, the things that you would get from her was impressions of, I want egg, I want egg, mine. And so, baby, things like that. So if you had have, if you had have tried to communicate with it, you would have got the impression that if you gave the pearl to, or the egg to the squid, that she would be happy and go away. And in fact, that's what would happen. Uh, room five was the cellar. So as you walk in, there's a table. On the table, there are several letters. And then on the wall, you will see barrels with these gold plaques on the barrels uh, with different types of liquids or indicating that there are different types of liquids on the inside. Uh, the, the text of it was that nine barrels are in front of you. Eight of the nine are poison. One of them is not. It is your job to try to figure out which one is not poisoned and take a drink from that and that is the way that you would get to the, get out into the next room the letters on the table if you look closely you would see that there were ideally four sets of each letter and jeff loves anagrams so if you knew you had four sets of each letter likely you were trying to make four five letter words and on the left there are the four or five letter words that you could make large lager regal and glare so if you look at that, you can immediately, if you know lager and you understand that lager is beer, type of beer, you can eliminate things like the rum, um, the brandy, the wine, things like that. So all those get dropped out immediately. Uh, if you look at Regal, you can then throw out um, things like the Jester's uh, Stout and the Dwarf Ale. And so then you have, you're faced with either the Moon King's Bach or the Sun Queen's Pilsner. Um, then you have the glare, meaning sun, and also large, if you think of it, the sun's much bigger than the moon, so that would have led you to the fact that you were supposed to choose the sun's queen's pilsner. You were transported to the feast room, which when you got there, you found that you were magically held. Pretty much that's all you knew. There was a little sign on the wall that said, unfastened chains. But yeah, actually, yeah, the T was the clue because normally you'd make a T with just two lines. And this one, you would actually make the T with three. So it's showing that you had to make something with three. Um, however, everything on the table was stuck down except for your silverware. Hmm, three pieces of silverware. So you, everybody, I, most groups, I think realized that you had to spell a word and with just that sign even when we play tested we thought huh it's chains I'm gonna look for some physical means to to unlock that so that's why we tried we told the the DMs make sure they know that it's it's a magical force there there is no physical lock so so we, we tried to help people that way the, the answer actually you could you could spell disenchant and one of the plates was gold and that's the plate you needed to start the D on and once you spell disenchant you're good to go as you walked into room seven, you were faced with a rust monster. Every purple token holder's worst nightmare. And of course, that had some unique challenges with it as far as combat. So you pretty much were immediately engaged in combat from the minute you walked in the room. You also saw over in the corner a chair, very interesting looking chair. Uh, so while you were fighting the rust monster, this chair just sort of sat there. And, and as you got closer and closer to hopefully killing the rust monster without destroying all your weapons in the process, um, the chair would animate, stand up, walk around. Uh, it was actually a really cool suit. So Great. she was actually uh, fairly um, hard to kill. She had quite a few defenses against all sorts of magical enchantments and charms and holds and things like that. Uh, she had some special attack, but it was pretty much a straightforward fight.
So then on the puzzle side, there was a sarcophagus room, and you also got to meet the lich. The sarcophagus that you have to, everybody has to put their arms in. The, the lich talks to you, and the sarcophagus holds the dust of an ancient ancestor who was a renowned sage. Uh, she's seen many uh, fail trying to uh, meet the deadly challenge to find the, the ring. We had some big metal rings. I thought, well, there's clues on the inside. You have to feel with your hand, and there's letters, and you, you feel these metal rings. And you've got your arms in. However, we had a blue hand who was underneath the table. And they, they had a ring in their hand. The, the idea is, as you're moving around, that there's a hand inside there that, was, that, that had the ring. That wasn't part of your party. And that's where the ring was.